This evening, we're going to pick up with lesson number two. In our last service, we taught on part one, the God of miracles, and we looked at miracles of finances. Tonight, we're going to look at the God of miracles, part two, miracles of healing, miracles of healing. But we're going to look specifically at the miracles of healing in the ministry of Jesus because we can learn lessons from those miracles because Jesus was not the only one involved in all the miracles. Some of the miracles that we read about, the person who got healed had a part to play. And so by studying that, we can learn, well, we do have a part to play, learn what our part is in receiving healing. Because so many times, actually most Christians think healing is entirely up to God. God does it all. We have nothing to do except pray, which they consider beg. Oh Lord, heal me. Oh Lord, heal me. Oh Lord, heal me. But there's more to our part than just begging for healing. So we're going to look at miracles of healing in the ministry of Jesus that we can identify lessons we can learn from. The first miracle of healing I want to look at is the healing of the leper in Mark chapter one, verses 40 to 42. It says, a man with leprosy came to Jesus and begged him on his knees. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. In this, we have one of the very basic but very important lessons every Christian needs to learn. Most Christians don't know. This man the leper asked Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Millions of Christians today still pray, Lord, if it be thy will, heal me. Or if they're praying for someone else, heal my brother, heal my mother, heal my son. They pray if, It be thy will. And many Christians, I've even heard Christians say they were taught that you should always in every prayer pray, Lord, if it be thy will. That is not true. They were taught wrongly. Just look at the prayers in the Bible. In the book of Acts, did the disciples pray, if it be thy will? You never read that. And in the letters of the epistles of Paul, Paul has recorded many prayers. I pray that the eyes of your heart be enlightened, that you may know the length, the height, the depth, and the width of the love of God. That you may know what is the hope of your calling. I pray. And in Ephesians Philippians, Colossians, he prayed prayers that are written. Those are excellent prayers for every Christian to pray. And I encourage you, if you haven't, go through the epistles of Paul and underline his prayers, and then you pray his prayers. But pray him for yourself and for your loved ones, your spouse and your children. You know, he's praying for the church, but pray them for yourself and your family. Those are powerful, powerful prayers, but I'll have you notice never one time did Paul ever say, if it be the Lord's will, may he fill you with the knowledge of his will. I pray that you may know what is the length, the height, the depth and the breadth of the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. He didn't say, if it be God's will. He didn't pray if it be God's will. None of Paul's prayers. And you can look where he says, I pray, I pray. If you use computer software, look for the prayers in all the letters of Paul where he writes, I pray. I pray that you this, I pray that you that. 
Those are powerful prayers that I encourage you. You should pray them for yourself and you'll learn a lot. So go through those letters and underline all of Paul's prayers and then pray them for yourself and pray them for your family. But Paul never one time prayed if it be God's will. So we have the example of Paul not praying if it be God's will. We also have it in the book of Acts. The disciples did not pray if it be God's will. When Peter and John went to the beautiful gate and healed the lame cripple man, Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. He didn't say if it be God's will. So you, we have many prayers in the New Testament that did not include if it be thy will, which is proof that it's not right to always pray if it be thy will. And let me explain why. Because there are different kinds of prayers. Or you could say Prayers for different purposes. Prayers with different purpose and motivation. Actually, worship is prayer in a way because you're speaking to God. Then there is the prayer of dedication. I dedicate myself to you. There is the prayer of faith. And of those two prayers, just look at the question, if it be thy will. The word if is a question. It's a doubt, right? But what is faith? True Bible faith is confidence. It's assurance. It's being Fully persuaded. If you read Romans 4 and 17 through 21 about Abraham, the father of our faith, he was fully persuaded that what God said he would also perform. So another way to say faith is believing. Well, believing is another way to say it is being fully persuaded. Or a conviction, an assurance, a knowing, knowing that you know, knowing that you know, fully persuaded. So if you're asking if it be thy will, are you fully persuaded? Absolutely not. You can see they are opposite of each other because If expresses doubt and uncertainty. I don't know. It expresses doubt and uncertainty. Faith is supposed to be confidence and fully persuaded, being full persuasion of something, knowing that you know that you know that you know something. Because only when you know that you know, can you actually step out in faith and do something And see God come through miraculously for you and see results. So faith is being fully persuaded, knowing that, you know, no question, no doubt about it. But if is expressing doubt. So praying, if it be thy will is the opposite of faith which means it actually negates faith or there is no faith there. There is no faith, no positive full persuasion when you pray if. So you're not praying the prayer of faith when you pray if it be thy will. The prayer if it be thy will needs to be prayed When you're seeking God's will, when you're seeking to know direction for your life, specifically the path you are to take 
steps you are to take, where you are to go, whom you're supposed to marry, what job you should take, where you should live. You're praying for God to show you the way. And Lord, is it your will for me to go this way? Is it your will for me to take this job or this job? Is it your will for me to take this man or this woman as my spouse? So if it be thy will is to seek the direction of the Lord. We actually only have that I recall, I could be wrong, but I only, all my study, I only recall one time the prayer, if it be thy will, was prayed. And it was by Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. But his was a prayer of dedication. He was surrendering, not my will, but your will be done. If it be your will, take this cup from me. He said, I'd rather not go through this yet. Not what I will, but your will be done. So he was saying, if it be thy will, yet he followed it with yet not my will, your will be done. And he was dedicating himself to the will and the plan and the purpose of God to do his will. He was not believing to receive something. There's a difference. When you believe to receive something, there can be no doubt involved as we will see. Even we're going to look at it later. Mark eleven twenty three. If you say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and do not doubt, but believe, do not doubt, but believe what you say, then you will have whatever you say. So the prayer of faith has to be based on knowing something. So if you don't know if it's God's will to heal, then ask him. But you cannot pray for healing in faith until you know that you know. But you don't need to ask very long. Because he already answered it. You don't have to keep asking again and again and again. He already answered. In the ministry of Jesus, only one person ever asked him, if it be thy will, you can heal me. It was the leper. Jesus said, I am willing. This is written in scripture. For eternity, age after age after age, it will never pass away. So Jesus saying, I am willing to heal is forever. For everyone. You never need to question it again. It's recorded. One time the question was asked, the answer was given. He will never give another answer. That's written, I'm willing So God's will to heal has been settled once and for all in answering the leper's question. He said, I am willing. And we are to know God's will. And if you're looking at the notes, letter A says, faith begins where the will of God is known. Known. Notice the word known. Knowing. You have to know Know that you know, and know that you know that you know in order to have faith. So the will of God must be known to have faith to step out and act in something. Otherwise, if you don't know that it's his will and you just say you're going to step out in faith, you're in presumption, not faith. If you don't know that it's God's will for you to do something, go a certain way, go a certain direction, take a certain job. You're in presumption if you just say, well, I'm just going to do it by faith. I don't know if it's God's will or not. I'm just going to go do it by faith. You're not in faith. You're in presumption. Faith is knowing God's will. Faith begins where the will of God is known. Now the question, if it be thy will, the word if, wherever there's a doubt, faith ends. Okay, let's say this is faith. This is your faith. 
Your faith is moving and working until you have a question or a doubt. If that's the point where your faith stops, you have no more faith beyond that point. Your faith, you are believing, believing, believing until you run into the question. If you wonder, is it God's will at that point, your faith stops. You are no more in faith. You have to answer the question, get the answer. And then once you know, then your faith can keep working and you know that, you know, you can believe you receive it. Hallelujah. So if you don't know that it's God's will, then you can't have faith to receive your healing. Well, God's word is his will. So if God ever gave promises for something, then he has given it as his will. You need to go into the word and find healing promises. And if you need help, go to my website at victoriousfaith.co and go to the tab called help from God's word. Under that tab, there's a list of topics with scripture promises for every topic and a confession for that. There's a healing list. Click on the healing list, read the healing promises and God has promises. There's also a confession for healing at the bottom of the list of scriptures. And so if you have a question, you need to get it answered. One other thing to answer about this, if it be thy will, anything that Jesus paid for on the cross in redemption, he paid for, for everybody for all time. So you never need to ask if it's his will for you to be delivered from it, if Jesus died and paid for it. What most Christians don't know, most Christians think that Jesus only paid for sin. But what they don't know is that when Jesus paid for sin, he paid for also the consequences of sin, the result of sin, which is the curse of sin and death. The curse of sin and death came in Genesis three when Adam and Eve sinned and they ate the fruit. God said, cursed is the ground. Cursed is this. The curse came on the earth and on every living thing, human and animal, which brought death, the curse of sin and death. Death is the ultimate curse. But death working slowly at low power in the body is sickness. Sickness is death working slowly or fast. If it's some fast working disease in the body until if it goes unstopped, it will produce ultimately death. So sickness is the curse of death working in the body. Lack and poverty is death in finances. Poverty and lack are death in finances. Strife and division is death in relationships. Strife and division. Anxiety, fear, worry, panic, it's death of the peace of mind. It steals peace of mind. So all those things are the result of the curse of sin and death, which came through Adam. It does not mean, although we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, it doesn't mean necessarily that you just sinned a sin and therefore you got sick because of it. No, it's because of the sinful fallen nature and that we do tend to sin until you have grown up spiritually and, and you curb sin more and more through discipline, a self-discipline, spiritual growth. You can curb sin more and more and, and sin less. A, a spiritual baby sins a lot more than a spiritual adult, but 
Still, the result is always death, which works through the curse. And it can come to attack in the body by sickness, disease, or injury, weakness, pain. It can be in the finances, bringing lack and poverty, loss. It can be in relationships by strife and division. It can be in the mind through fear, anxiety, terror, panic. It destroys the peace of mind. So all those things are the curse. All of those things were paid for by Jesus on the cross. When he died to pay for sin, he paid for the result of sin, which is the curse. So he paid for healing. He paid for financial increase, not decrease. He paid for wholeness and restoration in relationships, in families, in marriage, friendships. He paid for peace of mind. And you can find, I think, just about all of that in Isaiah 53, where we see the suffering of Jesus. By his stripes, we were healed. So we see that the stripes he bore on the cross and at the whipping post paid for our healing. By his stripes, you were healed. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. So we get our peace. But guess what? That word peace is shalom. Wholeness, nothing missing, nothing broken. It also is defined in the Hebrew dictionary as prosperity and health. And some places in the Old Testament, the King James Bible translates it prosperity. For example, I think it's Psalm 37, 4 or 5, says God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. That word is shalom. And it was translated by the translators prosperity. In Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. To give you hope in a future, that word prosper is shalom. Some translations say prosperity, some say peace, but it's wholeness in every area of life, including prosperity in your finances, because wholeness in every area of your life it requires your finances be whole as well, includes it. So you see, Jesus paid for sin and the result of sin, which is the curse. So he paid for your healing and your prosperity and the restoration of your relationships and your peace of mind. All of that was paid for. There are specific scriptures in the Bible for all those things that I just told you. So you never need to ask if it be thy will because that was paid for. Jesus died on the cross and paid for you to have it. It's yours. Just take it. Take the claim check. I mean, if somebody says, here, I paid for something for you. I bought it. It's at the store and it's in the pickup. You know, you pick up, they do no pickups now. You can drive up and pick up things. Go pick it up. Here's the receipt. Go pick it up. Well, Jesus paid for your healing and your blessing and prosperity and your peace and wholeness and relationships. Claim it. Turn in your claim ticket. I claim what's mine. I'm not going to let anything that Jesus paid for go without me receiving it. I'm not going to lose or go without, I mean, something that Jesus paid for and bought for me. So you need to claim what Jesus died to give you. Does God still heal today? Yes. Does God have a purpose for sickness? No. I've got other lessons on this and my YouTube channel on healing. I go through those questions and I answer them. You must answer the questions before you can have faith to be healed. It is God's will. How many will God heal? He will heal all. Jesus never refused to heal Anybody. Now, let me quickly read to you several scriptures here. They're in your notes that show how many did Jesus heal? 
Now, let me also point out that multitudes came to him. Church historians and researchers have gone back and discovered in some cases there were tens of thousands of people in a gathering following Jesus, listening to him teach. For example, like the Beatitudes, the mountain of Beatitudes where they all sat on the grass for three days and then he fed them. There were tens of thousands of people there. It says he fed 5,000 men plus women and children. Look at any church today, any church, pretty much most churches. Anyway, are there more men than women or more women than men? More women. So if there were 5,000 men, there's more women. And usually you can find two to one or three to one in a lot of churches. So at least 5,000 women or more. And then plus children could have been hundreds of children. Families bringing, I mean, back in those days, I think they had quite a few children. I mean, just look at Jacob. He had 12. They had quite a few children. And so if they brought, if a man and wife brought all their kids, they could have six kids. You know, easy. So hundreds and hundreds of children. There were probably at least 30,000 there on the mountain of Beatitudes. And maybe more. Some historians have said there could have been as many in some of the gatherings, as many as 50,000. 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, up to 50,000. That's a lot of people, okay? So keep that in mind. We're not looking at a small congregation of 20, 30, or 100, or 200. Most of the time, when Jesus was traveling, he had a crowd, and it was thousands. That's what a multitude means. Thousands. All right? So, Matthew 4, 23 and 24. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing how many? Some, a few, one or two. Every and all diseases. Every disease and sickness among the people. In the multitude, throughout Galilee, teaching and healing every disease that came to him, every person with a disease who came to him. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed. He healed them. Them indicates them all, those they brought. Hundreds of people came to him. 